G'day everyone! You may remember this bathroom heater from one of the previous videos. Today, the same customer has got us back in the bathroom. What we're going to be installing is this brand new bathroom fan. Given that the bath is over this side of the bathroom and the shower's on the opposite side, the customer has specified they prefer it above the shower. We're going to locate it towards the centre corner of the shower that comes into the middle of the bathroom here, considering there's timber and other things above the plasterboard ceiling. If you're unsure about where to locate bathroom fans, ideally you want to go somewhere between the shower and the bath. If there's just a shower anywhere inside the shower cubicle, generally we like to put them towards the corner of the showers. It makes a discreet location for them. Otherwise, if it's towards the centre and the downlight's already in, you may want to make it uniform and centre it to the downlights. These fans sense the moisture level in the air. When it detects moisture, it sucks the air out. If there's an increase in steam, it'll ramp the speed up to compensate. These fans here retail at Mitre 10 at around $530 each. Just to add a bit of spice to the video, the ceiling grills the customer likes are the Vinco 160mm cutout ones. So I'm going to install this one here with this fan system. So the grill inside it I'm not going to use for this job. So if you're installing the ceiling grill included in this kit, you want at least a 152mm hole saw, not 160mm for what I'm going to use in this video. The first thing I want to do is measure the distance between the wall and the edge of the glass panes here so I know where I can line the fan up on the ceiling. And then I'll subtract roughly 200mm from each side and that will bring the fan in line with the corner here inside the shower. Measurement from the wall to the shower end is 990mm. Exactly the same on both sides. The diameter of this is around 200mm. So we'll subtract 150mm to be safe off each side. 150mm is roughly 840mm out. I'm going to put a wee mark on the ceiling here at 840 by 840 When marking the ceiling, I do it very faintly with pencil. So I can always come back and rub it out later, especially if there's timber in the ceiling and I need to reposition the location of the grill. And as long as I do it very, very lightly and carefully, it leaves no blemishes at all on the ceiling itself. So here I've marked out 840 by 840. If you hear that, it's a good noise because it's hollow. It means there's no timber in this vicinity here. But with newer housing, we've got to watch out for the bottom cords on trusses, which can sit 20 to 30 mil above the jib, so you're never going to hear it from down here. And you do not want to make a hole in the ceiling in case there's timber above it. So we've always got to jump up in the ceiling and verify that the space above here is completely clear of all timber. Because we're working with a 160mm cutout, the minimum distance from the centre point that's going to have to be clear of timber is 80mm. So we've got to make sure 80mm from all directions of our mark is going to be clear from timber. Before jumping in the ceiling, you're going to want to make a mental reference of where things are that are easily identifiable in the ceiling. So here I've got two small downlights and a third big downlight there. Now we want to make sure we note the structural layout of the top plates in the ceiling because that's what we're going to have to locate. The ceiling access in this house is just on the other side of the wall there. So we roughly know the trajectory of where we want to go once we're up in the roof space. So up in the ceiling here, I found the big downlight just down there and the two small ones are located there and over there. Therefore I know the top plate that I'm standing on here and the top plate adjacent to it is the corner where the shower is located. So we're going to use this corner as a reference point. So I'll move some of these bats out of the way. The first thing I'm going to measure is how far that bottom cord of the first truss is from this timber here. Now that comes out around 660 mil. So 840 mil is going to be well in between these two trusses. So we don't need to worry about the timber 
above our hole. And if we look further, 840 millimeters is well clear of any timber. But there is this plumbing pipe to be aware of. The second measurement we're gonna do is off the adjacent top plate here that I'm standing on. And we're gonna go in line, 840 mil out, which is again, gonna be well away from any timber, which is that batten way over there, well outside of our hole. Always make sure that you place the bats back in their respective places. I'm gonna leave the bats clear of this area. I'm gonna go downstairs and show you guys a quick trick to verify that we're in the right location if you're still unsure at this point. For anyone who's still a little apprehensive, the best thing to do next, only after you've measured and verified, especially in a newer house where there is trusses, grab a small terminal driver, poke it through the center of your cross, And then what we'll do is jump in the ceiling and we can verify exactly where that is on the inside of the ceiling. So as you can see up here, the screwdriver has penetrated through the plasterboard right here. Now this is near the plumbing pipe. What you've got to realize with plumbing pipes is we can't really manipulate where these are and the ducting is gonna to have to go directly down onto the fitting here. AC pipes, we can manoeuvre out of the way, so they're not so bad. So what I'm gonna do in this situation is manoeuvre the hole to the left and perhaps this way slightly. Remember where this screwdriver penetrates the ceiling? It's from the center point of the hole, therefore we've got 80 millimeters to play with. As you can see, the pipe covers up from 30 millimeters onwards. If we move it over 30 mil, we're gonna be right on the edge of the pipe. So that's going to be adequate to use for cutting it out. In this case, I've actually moved the center point 40 millimeters that way, so I'm completely clear of the plumbing. I can place the grill up on the ceiling to get an overview of what it's going to look like when it's installed. Here I have my 160 mil hole saw. I'm going to cut this hole without filming because I want to ensure that I'm very careful about using a very heavy hole saw with a small hand drill, as if it drops, it may damage the glass or tiles in the shower. Before cutting, I want to ensure a clean environment below. I'm gonna move all of this gear out of the shower so it doesn't get coated in debris. Also, I'm gonna throw a drop sheet down here because it's not always good to have chunks of dust going down the drains. So there's the hole in the ceiling relative to the shower. It looks pretty damn good. And that plumbing pipe is right beside it. Looking outside here, we already have two existing grills on the exterior of the house. The bathroom is in this room here, which roughly sits about five meters from one of the existing grills. The first grill here goes back to the range hood. We cannot connect a bathroom fan onto a range hood setup. The second one here goes back to an existing bathroom fan and a separate toilet. This one we can definitely junction the bathroom fan into. In addition to these two external grills, we wouldn't want a third one in the vicinity because it would look unnatural. However, on the other side of the bathroom here, we could definitely throw one up on, in this area here. As long as we're not above a window, people can't look out and directly see an external grill on the outside of the house, Safit. Outside here, the new external grill is going to be 150 mil. So we're going to be using a 159 mil carbide tip bit for cutting through the Safit. As you can see, the external grill sits nice and snug inside the 159 mil piece. Need to relocate these portable veggie gardens out of the way. So what I've done here off camera is I've identified firstly where timber features in the Safit. Now if you look for nails that have been painted over, that dictates where the timber runs perpendicular to the wall. You can knock on it, you'll hear a solid noise behind the nail, which dictates there's timber there. And if you knock away from where the timber is, you'll hear a nice hollow noise. And that's where I want to cut into. 
Given that it's 159, 160 mil cutout I'm going to be doing, I have to allow for 80 mil clearance from the timber to the center of this. I've estimated 20 mil for the timber, and then I've left 100 mil extra to the center point of my mark. If I wanted to be a bit safer, and I wasn't sure of the thickness of this timber, I'd bring it out further left from this point. So maybe an extra 20 or 30 mils over. And that will eliminate any possibility of drilling where this timber in this feet. Before drilling, I want to make sure this feet isn't an asbestos containing material without adequate PPE. Because I know this is a modern house, I've got no risk of drilling through asbestos in the safete. However, if it was an older house, I'd generally get a small screwdriver and try and poke it through the safete where I'm going to drill. A good indication of a board that contains asbestos is the inability to push a screwdriver or screw a screw through it. So I'll quickly drill this one off camera. As you can see, I've cut a nice hole sent it to this feet and looking up you can see that the timber is a nice distance away from the edge of the hole here there's about 20 mils between the edge of the timber and the edge of the hole the next part I'm going to focus on is ensuring that there's power up in the ceiling available for this fan to plug into the first thing I'm going to do is identify an appropriate circuit Given these lights are independently switched, there's a good opportunity to use an existing cable for the centre light here and repurpose it for the fan and then connect all three lights on the same individual switch. Now I've already discussed this and got the go ahead from the customer, so always ensure you discuss time saving things like this with the customer, otherwise I would have to go through the process of bringing a cable down the wall, which may add a few hours to the job given the complexities with multiple cables already located inside this wall. Off camera, I'm going to quickly replace this light mech with a switch that's labelled fan for the fan circuit. And then up in the ceiling here, I'm going to go through it with you, disconnecting this light and connecting a power point. Before going in the ceiling, I want to make a decision on whether I'm going to use a bubble plug or a single power socket. If I wasn't going to have it isolated on the wall, given this fan is a top of the line automatic fan, I could run it off a power point that's left switched on up in the ceiling space. In this instance, because I've already got an isolator on the wall for the fan, I can put a bubble plug in the ceiling. I'm going to isolate and lock out the circuit before jumping up in the ceiling space. So off camera, I've replaced the light with a fan mech. As you can see, I've already gone through isolating and locking the circuit out. We'll jump up in the ceiling and disconnect the cable from this light and wire that socket into it. In the ceiling here is the down light in question. And what I can see is there's no cover over the terminals, which is not a good idea because someone could come along and accidentally put their fingers on the terminals when the light is switched on. Always test before you touch, because one day you might get caught out. Try and undo these terminal screws one-handed. Looking at the stripped ends on the cable, they look perfectly adequate to screw into the terminals on the back of the surface socket here. Nicely color-coded, so red, is going to be my phase, green earth, and then this unlabeled terminal is going to be my neutral, not the one that's got a plastic piece blocking access to it. That one there is just a loop terminal, functions as a connector. So I've double checked to ensure that the screw has clamped down only onto the copper, and I've done the pull test on each cable core to ensure the screw is done up firmly onto the copper. I'll attach the base, unclip the pin clip under here, and I'll relocate the socket somewhere near where I'm going to mount the fan unit itself, which is probably going to be in this area here. So I'll run it underneath the bats, 
and I'm going to secure it with a screw into the batten. Now that socket is securely fixed down and ready to plug the unit in. So the next part we're going to set up the fan unit for installing in the ceiling. Now the box comes with a 3 metre length of duct which is generally not enough to install one of these systems in the house. So you want to make sure you've got an extra 3 or 6 metre length to throw on the unit. And what I'm going to be doing is taping the shorter one. If there's one, this one here has been used. So it is inherently shorter than the 3 metre length. I'm going to chuck the shorter one between the fan and the bathroom inlet. And the longer one between the opposite side of the fan and the outlet. Double check the direction of airflow which is going that way. So we want the exterior duct on this side and the interior length on the other side. The best way to fix these to the units is with some duct tape. Now duct tape generally doesn't come with these in the boxes either so it's good to have a roll of these handy. They do provide cable ties I find it quicker and easier to use duct tape. Tape these together now. Now that I'm finished fitting the ends off, I can go and mount this unit in place in the ceiling. Taping it down on the floor here means I don't need to take this roll of duct tape up into the ceiling with me. Now for mounting the unit, first of all I want to make sure the airflow orientation is correct. So checking on the side here, the airflow is going outwards away from the hole to the outside. The hole's over in that corner there somewhere. The next thing with these units, we must make sure that this box is facing upright. So it's going to have to be side mounted and I'm going to side mount it on the side of this timber truss here. Now I want to make sure it's mounted so it's not putting pressure on the bats or on the ceiling itself but I want to have clearance so it's not sitting on the jib board it's not going to rattle around and make a noise. So that there is nice and secure it's not going to bounce around when it's operating. I've used nice long screws to get a secure grip on that timber. It's always best to follow the instructions as a good reference Unfortunately in these instructions, it says never to secure the unit directly to a beam but use a bungee cord around the fan motor in the ceiling. The next part, you chuck the ducting through the holes and put the insulation back in its place. Sometimes you have to cut the bats to make it fit nicely with the ducting. You can also plug the unit in while we're up here because there's no power on it at this point. Tuck the cable away underneath the bats so it's not a trip hazard. And then we'll chuck this end out into the safete down there. As long as the ducting is near the hole, I can put my arm up and fish it out. As you can see, 3 metres was only long enough to get from the fan to the outside here. Next thing is going to be taping the grill onto the ducting. The most important thing is orientation. So with these bathroom fans, the best aesthetic looking thing is to have the louvers facing the wall of the house. Now if we look from the outside here, we can't see any aluminium ducting once that's installed. Whereas if this was turned around the opposite way, you'll be able to look up it and see the aluminium ducting. So we'll have this facing the house wall. Before popping the front grills out, the best thing to do is tape it on so at least it's taped on the correct way. And then we can straighten it out and screw it in. Now that that's taped on, because I've used a 159mm hole saw, it will easily pop up into the safete. All I need to do is remove this internal grill 
to be able to access the screw holes. Now to make this perfectly aligned, I want to measure from the edge of the gutter in here to the edge of the unit. The first thing I want to do is anchor one screw in the corner, but hold it up as straight as possible while I do it. The first screw is done. I should also state the screws I'm using are stainless steel screws because it's an external environment. The next part, I'm going to measure from either side. From this side, we've got about 85 mil. And we'll double check that from the other side to make sure they perfectly line up. By doing these measurements, we're ensuring that the square grill is uniform with the other materials of the house. Now it's perfectly straight, I can go ahead and fire the rest of the screws in. Throw the square grill back on, you'll notice it will only mount one way. And that's the outside grill done, we'll go and do the inside grill. Same with the internal grill inside, I can remove some of the excess ducting by simply making an incision by cutting the wire and then just tearing a hole right the way around, making sure to keep it nice and uniform the whole way around. The next part, I'm going to remove the fascia simply by twisting it off. Because this internal grill is circular, it's always going to be uniform with the room. So I can simply tape it up and screw it straight to the ceiling. So now it's nicely taped a couple times around. I can easily push it up. Again, I'm going to use four stainless screws because it is a wet environment. Because I'm screwing into jib, I do not want to be using an impact driver. Now that the base is mounted to the ceiling, I can go ahead and remove the plastic film from the fascia and then clip it together. Now the fan's installed, we can give it a test. So with the automatic units, we can leave the isolator turned on at all times. Cheers for watching.